We are now shifting back into our food as medicine mode. Are you guys ready to power through the afternoon? We can do this. Remember, stand at any time. There'll be a snack break at some point. And she has been patiently waiting and getting frantic emails from me all morning saying, we're ahead, we're behind, are you still there? I am so delighted to introduce um, Alyssa from the Food as Medicine Coalition, the National Coalition of Medically uh, Tailored Meal Providers. I've heard her speak many times. She's a phenomenal speaker, even virtually. So I am going to toss it off to her as soon as we see her up on the screen. Hi, can you all hear me? We can hear you beautifully. You can get going and at some point we'll be able to see you. Okay, fantastic. Well, I'm going to go ahead and start in. I want to thank Elizabeth and the entire team at the Sunflower Foundation and especially all of you for spending time with me today to talk about food as medicine, medically tailored meals, and possibilities, really. Um, I've been set a rather tall order for the limited time we have, so I'm going to go ahead and jump in um, to our overview. I'll say a little bit about who the Food is Medicine Coalition is, um, and then talk about the role of medically tailored meals, that's the MTM, in food as medicine interventions, some of my favorite topics, policy and healthcare integration, um, the realities of provision of these services to rural populations, and then maybe some thoughts for the future. So first, who are we? The Food as Medicine Coalition is the national convening coalition for nonprofits that deliver medically tailored meals and groceries. These may be new terms to some folks, so I will explain them. Um, really, MTM and MTG are interventions. They're not just the provision of food. They're accompanied by nutrition counseling, education, sometimes medical nutrition therapy. They're focused on a population living with severe, complex, or chronic illnesses. Together, our purpose is to convene to increase access to these life-saving interventions through policy, through research, and through best practices. Our agencies created the Medically Tailored Meal Model about 40 years ago, and I'll say a little bit about that. Um, and together, we raise up new uh, practitioners of these interventions and also nourish the uh, community of practice that continues provision across the country. So a bit about our history, um, our agencies got their start rooted in community about 40 years ago at the height of the AIDS pandemic. This was a time when transmission was unknown, when people were wasting away because of the illness, and there really wasn't a lot of help for people in this situation. So volunteers entered people's homes and brought dignity and nourishment to that desperate situation for some what happened initially was we were bringing food to people, raw goods, groceries, and volunteers came back and saw that those groceries were still on the counter the next day. And that is when the epiphany hit that people who are in that state of illness actually need more than just food. They need meals that are tailored to their illness and the nutrition science that supports health and recovery. Very early on in the intervention, registered dietitians became part of the story um, and it was so important that these interventions were uh, part of a caring network in the community, supporting people as they dealt with the illness. Fast forward through mission expansion, where most of our agencies um, were asked to serve people living with cancer or cardiovascular disease or diabetes, et cetera, to now serving people living with over 200 different illnesses, uh, but still very rooted in community. Um, volunteers were really foundational and continue to be foundational to our intervention. Um, and that cultural competency and embeddedness is still foundational to our intervention. Um, something really important about our coalition, um, our meals are medicine, but they don't have to taste like it. And you're going to see that throughout my presentation. Deliciousness is important. So what is the intervention? Well, as I said, it's more than a meal. Um, it starts with a client referral, and that referral can come from a variety of different places, from a hospital, from a health plan, from someone's second cousin thrice removed, from a caregiver, from the person themselves saying, I'm sick, I'm hungry, and I need help. Um, we um, take that person in. 
They go through a nutrition assessment with a registered dietitian that creates the meal and care plan for them. That meal plan is cooked in our kitchens uh, with no starters or fillers or preservatives and delivered to someone's home. And then periodically people go through a uh, reassessment. Um, really foundational is that care um, underneath. You'll see the ongoing nutrition care process. Um, clients can call at any time and say, hey, my medication changed or I'm going into surgery next week or I can't eat fish anymore. And they, they get nutrition counseling and education, again, being surrounded by care. So you can see the comprehensive nature of what makes a medically tailored meal. Now, for us, a very stark reality is that the access to this intervention across the country is quite piecemeal. Our vision as a coalition is a future where anyone who needs this intervention and the accompanying intervention medically tailored groceries has access to it, that it is of the highest quality, and it is regardless of their ability to pay or where they live. A bold vision, but it is necessary. We do this, as I said, through providing service, through advocating for policies that expand access, which we'll talk about in a minute. We are known for our research demonstrating that the effects of this uh, addition to someone's care plan actually makes them healthier, not surprisingly, but also drives down healthcare costs and has a really intense impact on our healthcare system. And then finally, we are a community of practitioners and we support one another through technical assistance and capacity building. These are our three programs. I think that they're um, very important to the conversation we're having today as you all consider the landscape of Kansas and what assets you already have, the gaps that you may need to fill and what the future might hold. So I'm gonna start at the bottom of this slide. We recognize that um, there are communities across the country that still don't have access to these interventions. So how do we as nonprofits help fill that gap? We started an accelerator program that trains existing embedded nonprofits that know their community the best how to do what we do. And we teach them and they go forth into the community and deliver this service. We also have a very robust membership. Um, and that is where we do a lot of the building of the field that you can see here on the slide. Um, through our working committees. Our clinical committee is made up of registered dietitians. We have a research committee, a policy committee. Um, our ongoing healthcare partnerships are dealt with in the healthcare partners committee. And we convene um, the field through symposia and meetings. And then this year, we're launching our accreditation program. Why is this important? Well, we've synthesized over 40 years of experience to ensure fidelity to the quality that we provide in service of our clients. So when someone gets a medically tailored meal intervention, we wanna really understand what that means and make sure that when they get it, regardless of location, they're getting a similar intervention as interpreted um, in, the, in the context. So we'll talk a little bit more about that, but um, it's a great opportunity for us to ensure um, that quality is built into future policy considerations. So now that you know who we are and what an MTM is, because again, it may be a new concept, why does provision of MTMs matter in our context? Well, first I'd like to introduce um, the food is medicine pyramid. You may have heard about this today. So if you have, I apologize for retreading old ground. This is from an article that uh, I wrote with some folks from the CDC, from Tufts and from the Center for Health and Policy Innovation. It is an evolving concept that aims to demonstrate what food is medicine is, who gets it, and the kinds and types of interventions that are appropriate to different populations. Something really key about medically tailored meals that is not necessarily true of some of the government-sponsored programs that we have is we serve people of all ages. The lens we approach food with is illness. And so it is the most tailored of the interventions for the highest risk population. That is why you see it at the top of the pyramid. It's not because we're better. It's not because we deserve to be there. The pyramid represents the number of people who are receiving the intervention. So it's a smaller number of people, but it is a very um, impactful population to deliver these services to. 
underneath medically tailored meals, um, you see medically tailored food packages. That's where groceries are. So for people who don't necessarily have trouble cooking or shopping, they can receive those tailored meal packages and, and cook for themselves all the way down to population uh, level interventions that are supplying um, the American population with healthy food, um, very critical. Along the right-hand side, you see a really key element. It was along the bottom of the intervention slide that I showed that nutrition counseling, that education, that working within someone's cultural um, needs or understanding of food ways um, is really key to our intervention, and it, it really contributes to the success of our intervention. Um, for us, for the clients we serve, they may be eligible for that bottom population level um, healthy food intervention, or eligible for SNAP, or WIC, or other, uh, or Older Americans Act meals, Meals on Wheels. But the issue is they may not be able to eat them, and that is because they have very complex medical lives. Most of the clients that we are feeding through our um, interventions across the country are living with multiple illnesses at once, not just one illness at once. I used to work for God's Love We Deliver. I'll tell you the story about the name later. In New York City, it is the uh, large medically tailored meal provider there. Um, and at that time, more than 40% of the people we were feeding had four or more illnesses at once. So we have to layer diets to provide the kind of nutrition someone can eat that will contribute to their overall health and well-being and also contribute to their better health outcomes. An emerging body of research does point to medically tailored meals being efficacious for other populations, and that's where the research is headed. But our foundational population are those medically complex people who really need the tailored intervention. And so, unsurprisingly, some research has been done on this awesome life-saving intervention, and it has shown really remarkable outcomes. Um, this is a super generalization. If you're really interested in the deep dive, I'm happy to send Elizabeth and folks the uh, citations. But um, lower ED visits, lower hospitalizations, driving down the cost of healthcare overall, and most importantly for us as mission-driven organizations, making people happy. Patient satisfaction is incredibly important. In fact, some researchers last year did a uh, cost modeling study that showed if people who need medically tailored meals, again, a small population, but highly complex, actually got access to this life-saving service, it could save us as a nation in one year, 1.6 million hospitalizations and 13.6 billion with a B dollars. And that's net. That means absent the cost of food. And so you can see that there is incredible promise and incredible possibility, not just for people's health and human flourishing, but also for the healthcare structure in any state or for us as a nation. And so uh, knowing this, um, FEMIC agencies have been involved in a variety of really complex um, healthcare innovation measures where states, uh, largely in the CMS portfolio, so Medicare and Medicaid, have used flexibilities to start to provide this service and see what happens with people. I'm not going to belabor the many different acronyms that are on the right-hand side of the screen, but you can see that we've been really creative. And we have worked really hard to expand access. Um, but despite this, unfortunately, um, we still have a very piecemeal system. And a lot of this innovation has happened on the margins of healthcare, uh, though we're seeing some movement toward bringing it into the mainstream. And so I'm not sure why the slide isn't advancing. There we go. Um, and we saw a huge boost forward in this project um, at the White House conference that was held last year. I'm sure many of you know about it. It's, it's part of the focus on food as medicine. Um, it had five pillars, medically tailored meals and groceries were heavily featured, especially in pillar two. Um, and we're seeing a lot of movement toward um, focusing on this in a cross-governmental, cross-departmental way. But there's a reality check. 
um, despite all of our, as a coalition, um, despite all of our energy and all the attention and all the progress, the reality is that most of our agencies are actually primarily funded by philanthropy um, rather than the reverse, which is true of many found, uh, a foundation funded agencies where it's majority a government funding stream that's guaranteed and, and sustainable. Um, and, you know, we don't have access in certain states. So we as a coalition work very diligently to change this through those pillars that I um, showed you. Um, and I think that there's tremendous opportunity as we move forward um, for the future um, in using those policy le levers to expand equitable access. So I'm coming to the end of my presentation because I hope to get to some questions. I'm sure you have them. Um, Elizabeth asked me to just nod very high level to some of the opportunities and challenges that exist when bringing these interventions to rural populations. So on the left-hand side, um, I'll talk about challenges on the right opportunities, but I will say that one of the primary reasons why we have continued to advocate for these interventions being created in community is because you know your needs best. And so whatever the landscape is, there are solutions. So on the challenges side, um, a lot of the new opportunities are through health insurance funding streams, namely Medicare and Medicaid. That does not cover all. Um, it doesn't cover the uninsured, the underinsured, um, and it doesn't provide access to food as medicine in some instances. And so um, it really is a, a, a barrier to care. Then, of course, in rural landscapes, healthcare access, which kind of leans on transportation, leans on workforce shortages, um, that healthcare access, which can be a main entry point for these services, um, is not um, necessarily uniform and can be very challenging. I'm sure I'm telling you things that you already know, but I'll get to the opportunities and then we can have a conversation. Something else that we've thought a lot about um, is the production, delivery, um, and transportation around surrounding meal delivery in rural landscapes. Um, for us, we have some solutions to that, and many of our agencies have um, very robust programs that are beginning to um, get these services to people's doorsteps in, in rural areas. And then finally, it's really important to acknowledge the differing um, cultures that we come across in rural landscapes, urban too, but especially in rural landscapes and the stigma that might sur be surrounding the provision of food as medicine. With our roots in HIV services, uh, we have a lot of experience, um, you know, getting around stigma and opening up our services in an equitable way. So what are the opportunities with this rather stark um, portrait of some of the challenges. Um, well, first, I'd like to say um, telemedicine. Um, we have uh, we were all essential providers during COVID, and in fact, um, our expertise feeding sick populations at home was pulled on rather um, deeply by um, localities and states that were trying to figure out how to feed this new population of people who are sick and at home. We saw such an expansion of telemedicine. Um, during the COVID-19 public health emergency. Um, and much of that remains. And we also have expanded it on our philanthropic side to deliver services um, to people living in more remote areas. Um, a little obscured by the beautiful sun, um, shipping. Um, most of our agencies have robust shipping models that um, preserve food safety and still get um, tailored meals to people's doors. Um, one particular advantage I'd love to just really lift up, um, and unfortunately, I wasn't able to hear the videos it just played, so I'll go, I'll go visit the links. Um, but something that really resonates for me is the closeness to the source of delicious food. Um, we are in some ways repairing the connection between health and food sourcing. And I think um, there exists in networks that have not yet been built an opportunity to do that from the very beginning, source locally, source regionally, think about the challenges that evidence themselves in COVID um, around uh, production and procurement, 
and solve them from the beginning. And then community knowledge, um, really thinking about what interventions your particular community needs, not a different community, but building it from the ground up and identifying needs that are particular to rural communities. And the knowledge to solve those issues is also there. And then finally, we're all gathered together today um, through you know, the, the good uh, intention and the energy that Sunflower has put toward this important topic. And we can't understate the engine of uh, the states in, in that resources question. Um, again, communities have the resources, volunteers, people looking to solve these issues. I'll finish with a nod to the future, and it will be way too brief, but I hope we have a chance to continue our conversation as you all um, continue to build out the food as medicine piece of your work. Um, I think I'd like to talk about two different um, areas of opportunity. Um, on the, the policy side, since the White House conference and even before, we've seen a tremendous movement in legislative, administrative policy changes. On the legislative side, there's an actual bill in Congress looking to fund medically tailored meals. It's HR uh, 6780 on the House side and on the Senate side, 2133. Um, and it's looking to test the provision of MTM in a population in Medicare that doesn't have access. If successful, it can be expanded. That's a huge opportunity um, and a huge research study that'll give us a lot more information. Um, there are many other bills that are now being introduced around food as medicine, Medical Nutrition Therapy Act, others. So there's a lot of energy there. In administrative policy, CMS has issued um, some really helpful guidance about how supportive they are of food as medicine integration in new structures for funding like 1115 waivers um, and state-based opportunities. There's also a tremendous movement to screen and identify need and to pay for these services on the healthcare side. From the infrastructure side, um, there's a lot of uh, lattice that needs to be created between healthcare and food, like billing codes and the actual language to describe what it is we're providing to people. Um, you know, clarification of privacy and how HIPAA uh, interacts with some of these um, interventions. Um, and then the referral structures, how does that work? How do we connect these systems and not unwittingly throw up barriers for people to access them? On the research side, since the White House Conference specifically, there are a number of field-wide initiatives that have sprung up to fund food as medicine research. Today, the American Heart Association and Rockefeller announced the first wave of grantees for their very large food as medicine initiative that's multi-year, for instance. Um, there's a new focus on, yes, we know food as medicine produces good health outcomes, but is that success? What do our communities say is success? And what kind of structure are we creating as we combine these two fields? So a lot of thoughtful community-based research questions there that are starting to change the conversation. Um, and the opportunity to test local and regional pilots and to look at more than just healthcare outcomes to look at the effect on the economy of creating jobs, the effect on the local food system of sourcing locally, and so much more. So I'm going to end here. I hope that was enough to, of a taster to get us to a few questions, and I'll pull down my slides. Um, Elizabeth has my uh, contact information, but should you have any questions, feel free to contact me. Elizabeth? Thank you so much, Alyssa. Appreciate that. That was a great overview. Um, we'll take a few questions from the room, but I'm going to, as we're waiting for anyone to show to Brandon, they have a question to ask. I wanted to shameless, actually, I'll ask this in the form of a question. Can you tell us about the Food is Medicine Coalition and the quarterly calls that you do? Because I know I have personally learned a ton by being part of that group. Absolutely. Thank you for that uh, fantastic plug for our quarterly calls. So uh, in January, April, July, and October, we hold a Come One, Come All quarterly call for the field. It pulls on providers from across the country, government officials, healthcare plans, everybody comes. 
um, uh, sometimes several hundred people. And we, we feature a learning from the field. Um, and then we have a discussion and an opportunity to share some local updates. Uh, also, anyone can join our FEMIC Lister. We do a weekly, uh, a monthly newsletter and then um, things of interest for the field. Please also follow us on Twitter, LinkedIn, think Instagram. Um, you can find us uh, and we, we definitely keep that conversation alive. Thanks, Elizabeth. No, that's like I said, it's a, and it's free. It's a great resource. Free. Yeah. It's totally free. Um, a, a question that I have been asked before about medically tailored meals, and you seem to be the perfect person to answer this, is are you seeing in the sector a role for um, food banks um, in general, you know, like a, a large food bank to be preparing those meals, or are you primarily seeing it more in very specific MTM service agencies doing that? Oh, there's absolutely a role for food banks. I am right now sitting in a beautiful conference room in Boston. Um, I'm from, I'm, I live in New York. I'm here at Community Servings, which is one of our medically tailored meal providers, as an instructor and part of the leadership team for the Accelerator. Uh, the Accelerator actually has several food banks in it. Again, this is the program that raises up and, and teaches people to deliver and prepare medically tailored meals the way um, I've just described it. And um, we have a number of food banks that have gone through that program. Food banks often have the resources as well as the operational capacity to engage in delivering uh, medically tailored meals and are a, a real key partner in expanding access. Excellent. And we have a question from the audience. Um, so I recently ran across, um, we had been reaching out to Magic Kitchen in Kansas, and I could see on their website that they said that they did medically tailored meals and to talk, you know, to people across the state. And I was trying to figure out how do we know when patients, how people can access, because it looks like they're doing it and it's happening, but I don't even know how to know when my patients could do that or how? Oh, what a fantastic question. So um, I think one access thing um, to keep in mind as we talk about access um, is, is access a pay for provision or is it a free provision? Our commitment as nonprofit providers is that it is free to clients. And then we braid the funding on the other side because from the perspective of someone who is sick and hungry, that is a really key uh, barrier to sweep aside. And so there may be provision of meals, um, but it may not be free to clients. So that's one thing to keep in mind. The other thing is, um, how are you setting up referrals? Like I said, we really favor a no wrong door entry. So we do have very serious, our agencies do have very serious um, healthcare contracts with med managed care companies. They have MOUs with hospitals who don't tend to be um, part of the payer network, but are referring people who need services. We have, you know, many different um, arrangements with other social services entities that bring people into the program. This really started in community and it's making its way backwards into healthcare. And that is why the tracking, the recording, the coding of those interactions. So you um, could see what kinds of services someone is getting is a little slower to take root. There's a lot of work being done on statewide referral networks, um, a lot of work being done on the screening referral service billing evaluation pathway, because um, they're all disjointed right now. Um, and I think your question um, is a good one to ask in community. So getting into a room with the hospital, a payer, a CBO, and a social services organization to say, how are we going to help coordinate care? Um, so I hope that that was helpful. That was terrific, Alyssa. And just to um, give you a little more context on Jody, who asked a question, she uh, works at an FQHC um, in Northwest Kansas in such a rural part of the state, their FQHC serves 10 to 12 different counties. So it's kind of, when you were talking about that opportunity with rural, um, that's where it's at. Do we have any more questions at this point? 
Oh, we do have one question on Zoom, and Gabby will read it aloud. Yeah, I'm sure you can see this, Alyssa, but for the benefit of the audience, um, can you talk about how you engage with industry partners, uh, trade associations, food companies, policy slash legislative officials, and how to give them a role in this space? Trying to operate from that space of we all have a role to play. Um, we heard earlier about calling supermarkets. Mm hmm yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for that. This is a cross-sector approach. None of us can do this alone. Let's just say that outright. I mean, I hope from my opportunity space, you could see all the different players that are implicated in those opportunities. In the policy space, you have your local policy, your state-based policymakers, and federal policymakers. In this role, I concentrate a lot at the federal level. In previous roles, it was very state focused. And right now, so much of the policy opportunity is at the state level. They are the engines of innovation. On the one hand, it's a tremendous opportunity because um, the federal government is basically saying, you can do this and you can do it in a way that answers state identified needs. On the other hand, it really then puts the onus on states to innovate. So those state-based policymakers are your partners. And because food as medicine is a bipartisan issue, the bills that I mentioned in Congress, completely bipartisan, feeding people, making them happy and saving money, is there really a downside here? Um, so remember that nature of this issue, um, they are your partners. And then food sourcing and where do people go to get their food? Where do people go to get their care? You've already implicated the, the food um, production side, the sourcing side, farmers, right? You've implicated your healthcare system. So all of these players have to be at the table. We're actually gonna set up a system that works for clients. All right, well, thank you, Alyssa. Another round of applause for Alyssa, please. Thank you all so much. I, I know really it's hard to connect <laughs> virtually, so we, we appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to connect with us and uh, look forward to learning more about the coalition as we kind of move forward. Of course, and please follow up with me via email, join our quarterly calls and our listserv, and I look forward to being a resource. Uh, thank you all so much.